Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning and allowing us to get together and enjoy each other's company. God, we look forward to the lesson that Lanny has prepared this morning. And I just ask your blessings on those who are here to keep us well, to keep us excited about what you have in store for us, God, and to use us as you can throughout our week so that we can shine your light everywhere we go. God, I ask your blessings not only on those that are here, but those online like Jeff and others that we know that are out there watching because they want to learn. God, uh, just bring that knowledge into us, and, uh, and I thank you again for Lanny and his preparation for that. May you be with us. May we be your servants this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Well, we're going to be entering into a section here of this study of uh, 1 Peter, the second chapter, uh, that has some somewhat uh, emotional topics, subjects that we'll be looking at. I want to, I know it's awkward in this setting to have much communication and, and you feel a little awkward getting up and going to the mic so that our online people can participate. But I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on these things because some of these are um, maybe not controversial, but certainly emotional. And um, while I don't think I'm narrow-minded, I am somewhat narrow-sighted. So if I don't see your hand go up, somebody help me so that I, I'm not overlooking you. I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> you need a bell. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just not seeing you. So uh, we're going to jump into this, and uh, I have some stories to tell. I hope you'll be patient with me on that, but I just, uh, they're, they're interesting to me. Whether <laughs> Hopefully you'll find some of them interesting too. We left off last week talking about desiring the sincere milk uh, the spiritual milk, and he uses the metaphor of a baby, an infant, uh, earnestly desiring the the milk from the mother. And we uh, mentioned that uh, you know in our culture, the reason I don't have a picture up here of a uh, because certainly when Peter wrote this, he didn't have the image of a baby holding onto a, a bottle of milk. <laughs> He had the image of, a, of a, a, a body nursing at the mother's breast. And uh, it's funny how our cultures change and morph over time. You know, we, uh, we still are uncomfortable in our culture. And I don't say this critically. I'm just stating fact. We're, unculture, we're uncomfortable with having a mother nursing a child in public. Uh, it's, it's interesting, when, when I was a, a teenager, um, you know, bathing suits were one-piece bathing suits, and they were pretty modest where I lived, in Oklahoma anyway. It may not have been out in California, San Diego. <laughs> but, but now, of course, you know, you can't even turn on the television without seeing... Uh, everything except the, the nipple. But we still have the cultural stigma, if you want to call it a stigma, about a, a child nursing in public. And, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm just, just stating fact. That's not true in other cultures. And uh, I've spent time in a number of third world countries, as you know. And uh, when we were in uh, Guyana, South America, up on the northeast coast of South America. I made, I don't know, three or four trips down there for medical missions. Well, I'm not a medical person, so my job there was to share Jesus Christ with the people who came to the medical mission to have various ailments looked after. And it was optional for them to visit with us. They didn't have to do that. They could see a doctor without that, but every one of them that I ever knew about always was interested in talking to those of us who went to share the good news of Jesus. Guyana is primarily Hindu and 
Muslim, a little bit of Christian, a little bit of Amera Indian, as they call them, the natives there, but primarily pretty even split between Hindu and Muslim. Well, we were forewarned that when we went into that environment, they didn't consider breastfeeding to be something that was taboo, that we might very well have people in the clinic because they would bring their babies with them and they would be there maybe all day and those babies would get hungry. So it was kind of a little bit jarring, I will admit, the first time that I was sitting having a Bible study with a, a mother and her baby got to being fussy and so she just did what she always does. She began to nurse the baby. Some of our American preachers who went with us um, had a pretty difficult time with that. It wasn't that they uh, opposed it. It was just that it was very, very uncomfortable for them. There was, I probably shouldn't tell this, but I will anyway. There was one, one woman there who was sitting in line waiting to see the doctor. And a rather large woman. Um, and as she was sitting there, a um, the little boy comes up and, and wants to nurse, walks up and wants to nurse and, and does. And another little boy comes up. Well, she has two breasts, so uh, she's nursing both of them. And, and one of our sweet little sisters, not being unkind, but just couldn't help herself, went up to her and says, how old are those boys? I, are, are they, why are they still, why are your children still nursing? And she says, oh, oh, these are not my children. I'm just the wet nurse. <laughs> so, Anyway, enough of that. The text in verse says, you are coming to the anointed who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people but has been chosen by God for good honor. The cornerstone, what a persistent and powerful metaphor of Jesus Christ. In relation to architecture, of course, as you know, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone stone laid in the structure with all the other stones laid in reference to it. Cornerstone marks the geographical location for orienting a building in a specific direction. It's the rock upon which the weight of the entire structure rests, and all of that certainly is very appropriate and very applicable to the way that we look upon Jesus as serving that purpose as we build our lives, as we build our uh, sacred community solidly and firmly anchored to and directed by that cornerstone. This occurs in a number of places in Scripture. Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is the way that Paul describes what Peter is talking about. Going all the way back into Hebrew Scripture, Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will never be shaken. And then Jesus quotes from this, Matthew 21. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus himself acknowledging himself to be that cornerstone. And then when Peter and John were there before the Sanhedrin being commanded to quit healing and teaching in Jesus' name, Peter says, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has now become the chief cornerstone. So this idea, of this metaphor of the Jesus being the chief cornerstone is ancient and modern and very, very relevant. And you are living stones. 
that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. I just ran across this picture. I've never, I, I'd never seen that before. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Lithops optica. They, they look like rocks, but they're uh, succulents. They're, they're plants. They're living flowers. We call them living stones. That's not what Peter was talking about, but I thought it made a good illustration. <laughs> they do exist, yeah. Living stones, spiritual temple, holy priests, holy cow. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. We're pretty important. Did you know it? That's pretty important. You know, when God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai, while they were still there at the base of the mount, God gave Moses instructions on how to build a tabernacle. And uh, Moses put it together just the way that God had ordered him to do so. And in the special section of that, behind the very heavy veiled curtain, they placed the Ark of the Covenant and on top of the Ark of the Covenant was what came to be called the mercy seat. And when all was done and all was completed and ready, then the Shekinah glory of God, with much fanfare, with fire and smoke, came into the Holy of Holies, and God took up his dwelling there on the mercy seat in the Ark. Present with the people, but separated from the people, because only the high priest, once a year on the, on the time of Yom Kippur, could go into that space, and only with blood. In time, as they entered into the promised land and settled it, David gathered together all of the materials, and his son Solomon built what became the temple on the Jerusalem Mount, and when the temple was completed and all was done with great fanfare, with fire and smoke, the ark was placed in the Holy of Holies in the temple, and the Shekinah glory of God moved in and dwelt among the people. I don't guess we could even estimate the dollar value in today's money of Solomon's temple. There was so much gold in it. There was so much material that came from so far away. And the, the workmen that they brought in from all over the country to uh, all over the world to, to do the craftsmanship, it's just incomprehensible what that would equate to in today's dollars. So Jesus moves into the temple and takes up residence. And then as time passes and the kingdom divides and people grow further and further away from God, and the northern kingdoms have been carried into Assyria, and now the time comes and it's imminent that the Babylonian Empire is going to come and take over and destroy Jerusalem, including the temple. And prior to that... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is removed from the Holy of Holies and is taken into hiding. The Shekinah glory of God departs the temple. We don't know for sure from Hebrew scripture, but uh, in the book of Second Maccabees, chapter 2, verse 7, it says that the Ark was hidden in a cave on Mount Nebo by the prophet Jeremiah, who said that this place shall remain unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. Uh, people have been looking for the ark now for 2,000 years, and not even Indiana Jones could find it. So it may remain hidden until Jesus comes again. But now the, uh, the temple is destroyed, and the Shekinah glory of God has departed the temple. And as they come back from Babylonian captivity, what, some 70 years later or so, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and make an attempt to rebuild the temple. 
And the people who saw the temple, who had remembered what Solomon's temple looked like, wept because it was so inferior to what Solomon had done. But the ark was gone. The Holy of Holies was empty. God's presence was not there. And time passes. And 600 years later, on the day of Pentecost, following the first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Shekinah glory of God, re-inhabited the temple. Not Solomon's, it was gone. Not Ezra nor Nehemiah's. Not Herod's, but the living temple of God. The people. You and me. Never to depart again. Think about that. We are the living temple of God. We are his holy priests offering spiritual sacrifices. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year with blood. But we have free access. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. God dwells with his people. That's what it means to be priests. It's overwhelming. Overwhelming. As is contained in Scripture, and here he's quoting again from Isaiah 28, 16, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen with, for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Other translations say never be confounded, never be put to shame, never be disappointed. Take any one of them you want or take all of them. They say the same thing. Yes, you who trust in him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the very cornerstone. Jesus, the cornerstone. I found this little composite uh, of a familiar hymn, and it's about your name.
Dee, did you do the virtual recording, the virtual album with us? No, I didn't. We, we did 25 songs um, during the quarantine, the Praise and Harmony, acapella Praise and Harmony. And uh, that's not as easy as it looks, I tell you. <laughs> I recorded all 25 songs in my office, and they were all part of a composite like that. And uh, the technology of it and the uh, coordination of it is, uh, is challenging, to say the least. I prefer doing it in person. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Similar passage from Peter, I mean from Paul, 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach God, Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Uh, maybe Peter is thinking a little bit about the time when they were in Caesarea Philippi and Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my sacred community, my ecclesia. We have any geologists in here? This is a Leverite stone. Any of you all seen Leverite stones? The guy in front of it is a civil engineer. They're building a road, and they come up to something like he does, and he says, leave it right there. We're going around it. <laughs> Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy... Now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage, against, wage war against your very soul. Uh, these two statements here, you had no identity and you received no mercy, uh, are two of the statements that uh, really uh, emphasize to us that this is not just written to the diaspora of the Jewish Christians. He would not say this to the Jewish Christians, would he? He would not say you were a people who had no identity. The Jews had a very distinct identity. He would not say uh, that uh, you received no mercy. The Jews received extreme mercy. In fact, this is uh, so strongly stated that some scholars have even concluded that the letter was written only to non-Jews. I don't believe that is true. I think there's a lot of it that is very applicable to, to the Jewish Christians as well as to the Gentile Christians. And uh, as we have said previously, uh, in my opinion, at least this is a letter that Peter wrote to the, to the all Christians, then and now. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. King James says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior or your good deeds or your conversation, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. This, uh, this uh, is quoted by uh, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This word that, that Peter uses here, uh, this translated conversation in the King James, uh, he uses it about seven times during these two short uh, letters, uh, first and second Peter, ha has to do with uh, our conduct, with the way that we live our lives, and the, uh, the way that we present ourselves to our community, to our neighbors, to the people we interact with in our daily lives. It's a very important concept for him. For the Lord's sake, submit to all or to every human authority, whether the king and the, the king, of course, for Peter was the emperor, but it's not unusual for the emperor to have been referred to as the king, as head of state or as supreme. Um, 
or the officials or governors. These are the people that the emperor would delegate to, designate to carry out his authority. For the king was, has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. For the Lord's sake, what? Submit to who? The emperor, the king. Submit to authority. Because after all, he's sent by God to do God's <coughs> bidding. You know, we in our Church of Christ heritage have used the um, method of, of interpretation to be uh, God speak to us by command example necessary inference and a command is a command is a command right here's a command right this isn't a suggestion it isn't a necessary inference Submit to the government. That's what it says. Paul said the same thing. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which is from God. Really? The authorities that exist have been appointed by God. Really? Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authority and not only to avoid punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Paul, what are you talking about? This is my friend Song Yong. He lives in South Korea. I stay in pretty close touch with him thanks to the Facebook. Spent a month with him, Donna and I did, in Seoul. Marvelous guy. When he was about 16, he lived in North Korea where he was born. His dad said, son, <laughs> There's nothing for you here. You need to get out. He gave him the equivalent of $20 and a little scrap of paper that had an address on it. The address was hopefully where one of his relatives still lived. Didn't know for sure. Didn't know if he was alive or not. But the last they knew, this is where the relative lived in Seoul. Song made his way out of North Korea some way. He didn't share with me how he got out, but he did. And went to Seoul and found the address and his relative still lived there. He was running a laundry. Song lived and slept, ate and breathed in that laundry slept on the floor, and in time became an expert on how to run a laundry, so much so that uh, even the government would commission him to go to places that were struggling and help them straighten out their mess. He would take all of his spare money and buy textbooks and educated himself. Somewhere along the line, he ran into a missionary who was from the Church of Christ, and he taught him the good news of Jesus. And Song became uh, obsessed with that to the extent that he gave his whole life to promoting that. And one of the major ways that he did that was to begin... Uh, prog a program of training teachers, training preachers in Bible knowledge and in the Church of Christ doctrine. He got associated with Sunset International Bible Institute, which is how I came to be a part of his 
sphere of influence and with some of the uh, um, uh, Fried Hardman University. And um, he, when the internet was still young, uh, managed to secure the rights to the uh, IP address Bible.org in Korea, which he's been offered huge amounts of money to buy from him and has refused to do so. He has a huge internet presence. Uh, when we were there, this building that you're looking at now, right there in the middle, it was just completed a couple of years ago. I can't even imagine what that cost in Seoul, Korea. Seoul, South Korea. The one we were in was rented. It was, uh, we were on the seventh floor of a, of a building. He had the one floor. And uh, we stayed there. They had a little kitchen there, and we had all the classrooms there, and the students would come. And uh, that picture, I think, of the classroom, I believe, it's not my picture. I have some, but that's not mine. But I think that's in the older building. I think that probably the classroom where I taught, it looks the same. Um, but these students would come from all over South Korea and... Uh, study there to become teachers and preachers in South Korea. I tell you that because the class that I was teaching, one of the classes that I was teaching while we were in, in South Korea was Romans. And we got to that 13th chapter of Romans, which we just read. And I was just going along, of course, working through an interpreter, obviously, just minding my own business, teaching my material like I would always teach my material. And we got to this passage on honoring the government, submitting to the government. And I happened to look back in one of the corners of the room, and there was a young woman there who was obviously extremely upset. I couldn't tell if she was angry or hurting or crying or what, but very upset. And you know why she was upset, right? That's where she came from. How can you tell me to submit to somebody like that? How can you do it? That's crazy. I can't remember now if it was, if it was Kim Jong-il. I think it was still Kim Jong-il who was in when we were there. I don't think uh, his son, Kim Jong-un, has been that far back. The other picture there is uh, Kim, Yoo, Kim Yo Jong, which is the younger sister of Kim Jong-un, who by most estimates will likely be his successor if anything happens to him, and who by most estimates is more radical than he is. It's not a good situation. The slide says around 60,000 North Korean Christians are locked up uh, because of their faith. I think the number is much closer to 75,000. Nobody knows for sure, but it's a lot. North Korea is the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. And yet Christianity continues to grow there. Surely Peter didn't understand that there would be people like Kim Jong-un that he would be asking Christians to submit to. Or he never would have said that, right? Well, maybe he would, because this is the guy that Peter was dealing with. This is Nero. Nero was not a good guy. He was psychopathic. He was responsible for Peter being crucified upside down. He was responsible for Paul losing his head. How could Peter and Paul possibly tell us to submit ourselves to these kinds of government. I also had the opportunity to go to Cambodia 
And in Cambodia, I walked the killing fields. This is Pol Pot. Conclusion of the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Two million of his own citizens slaughtered in the most merciless ways to create this utopian communist society. They did away with money. There was no such thing as money under his reign. All of the people in the city were driven to the countryside and made to farm. But you couldn't eat your own farm produce. You had to eat whatever they gave you of your farm produce. And many people died of malnutrition. The picture there on the left, the tree that's called the laughing tree, which is a terrible misnomer. They hung huge loudspeakers up in it and played loud music to blare out, to drown out the sounds of the people being killed. And they used it to bash the heads of babies against. There's still mass graves all over Cambodia. Peter, Paul, why would you tell us to submit to government authorities? And of course, we don't even need to talk about that guy, do we? I saw recently where, <clears throat> as late as uh, 2019, they were still finding mass graves in Europe that linked back to Hitler and the, and the Holocaust. I don't know the answer to this, and I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you who are wiser than me to uh, share your thoughts on this. It's, it's difficult. One extenuating circumstance, if I may, Acts 4, but to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we, that's the Sanhedrin, these are the officials of the Jewish secular and spiritual law must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now this is the authority for the Jews. It's a little bit different because this is not Rome saying this. This is the Jewish authority, the highest court of the Jewish authority, the Sanhedrin are telling Peter and John, you can no longer heal, because that healed the lame man. You can no longer heal or teach or speak in the name of Jesus. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, this is the same Peter that's writing First Peter. So what's the solution? That's a question. <laughs> How do we balance this? How do we reconcile this? How do we submit to secular authority? in the face of the things that are going on in the secular world. Maybe it's a little harder for us to, to grab, grasp this because we have not been subjected to this in our culture, in our generations. Yeah. We haven't had this kind of a, of, a, of a government that has been so oppressive and so suppressive and so cruel. So we haven't had to individually and personally wrestle with this. But what if we were in another place where, what if we were in North Korea? What if we were in China? 
What if we were in Nigeria? How would we wrestle with this? Todd, you're smart. Come over and straighten this out for us. He's just sitting there shaking his head. Anybody? Come on, Jeff. Anybody else? Yeah, we've run out of time already. You're going to have to make it pretty quick because we're getting ready to shut her down. How we, how we uh, do this, uh, we just, uh, whatever you said, uh, we um, just do it from our heart. And if no one waves their hand, uh, we just do it from their, I mean, from our hearts and hope it's uh, wide. I do not have a better answer than that. Thank you, Jeff. Well, next week is a whole lot easier. We're going to talk about slavery. That's what Peter's talking about. So that's what we'll talk about. And I'm even going to be so bold as to talk about what slavery has meant in the history of the Church of Christ. So you don't want to miss that for sure. Thank you for your presence, for your attention, and for your patience with me. Have a wonderful God-blessed week.